Today, I want to start with a new series for this year. It's called the Turnaround Series. And uh, the Turnaround Series is really about turnaround prayers that men and women of God have prayed to God and then caused a turnaround to happen in God and in their own person and in the circumstances. So these are very powerful prayers. And I tell you, I'm really excited about the series. I hope you are too, because as we go through this series, we will glean great insights into how, why, and when we can change the course of history and change the course of circumstances. Because turnaround prayers will give us these vital insights. So I'm passionate about them. It will tell us how we can pray better. It will tell us about God. It will tell us about our lives. It will tell us about our relationship and our journey here in this life. And how as we learn the whole uh, process of learning to pray, turn around prayers, the first person that will turn around is we ourselves. Can somebody say it? Amen. So I would like to bring you uh, to the first turn around uh, uh, sermon of the series, and I'd like to bring you to the time when Abraham prayed a turnaround prayer as he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'd like to entitle the first of this turnaround series sermon, Can God Change His Mind? Let me tell you about a story uh, about a marriage seminar that took place, and somewhere halfway through the seminar, in this marriage seminar, the counselor who was giving the talk, stood up and said, let me ask you a question. Who has the cleaner mind, men or women? And there was a fierce debate as to who has the cleaner mind. And eventually the debate raged on and eventually said, stop, I'm calling you a truce and I'll tell you the answer. Actually, he says, to tell you honestly, women have the cleaner minds. And all the women started clapping. And he says the reason for that is because they are changing their minds all the time. That's why. Do you change your mind? Well, many people do. We have about 7,000 thoughts a day. And in that 7,000 days, uh, 7,000 thoughts, we have many times, maybe hundreds of times, where we change our minds in small and big ways. So let me take you to a time, an incident in the Bible, where God appeared to change his mind. And this was when Abraham met firstly the three men whom he later found out to be messengers from God or angels sent from God to visit him, to give him a special word. And after these three men had uh, taken off Abraham's hospitality, you know, and Abraham showed them great kindness, they then set their face towards the city of Sodom. They were on their way there. And it was then that God revealed to Abraham that he was sending these, his messengers, to the city of Sodom to find out about the wickedness of the city because he had intent to destroy the city. And we take up that story in Genesis chapter 18, beginning from verse 22. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near, somebody say drew near, and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham said uh, to, then Abraham answered, uh, and said, suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. And God answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And this conversation went on and Abraham went down to 30, pleading for the city of Sodom if 30 righteous men were found there. Then he went down to 20. And eventually, he came to 10. Then Abraham said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again. But this once, suppose 10 are found there. And God answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. The Lord then went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned 
to His place. Question, does God change His mind? Well, there was a taxi driver. He was, a, he was an Irish taxi driver, and, you know, he couldn't find a car park lot in busy New York. So, you know, as he was driving around many, many rounds around the block, couldn't find a, a car park, empty car park lot, he said to God, God, if you will, you know, if you will find me an empty car park lot, just bring me an empty car park lot. Just do it now because it, it's so urgent. I, I will stop drinking. I will stop gambling. I will stop smoking. I will stop womanizing. I will, and just then he found an empty car park lot, just down there. And he says, okay, okay, God, I found it. No need already. Okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes we change our minds because, you know, suddenly the things that we have, we, we want suddenly appear and we think we really don't need God anymore. We change our minds all the time in life. But God does not change His mind. Here's the first thing we need to understand as we deal with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not change his mind. Because if God changes His mind all the time and is always fickle and capricious, then there's no way we can actually have a stable relationship with Him. Today it's okay, tomorrow it's not. Or this week it's great, but next week it's terrible. Uh, because if He's not stable and He keeps changing His mind, we don't know where we are. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 tells us that God does not change His mind. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Again, in another verse, Numbers 23, verse 9, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. So God does not change his mind. Can somebody say an amen? That is the doctrine of immutability, that God is changeless and unchanging. Now, it reminds me of a story of a uh, a man who went to the cattle market to sell his milk cow. As he was walking along, a stranger came up to him and said, how much are you selling the milk cow for? Well, said the man, $300. Hmm, said the stranger, how much milk does he give? Well, said the owner, 30 liters a day. Hmm, said the man, but how do I know you're speaking the truth? Oh, said the man, you can trust me. I am a Mennonite church elder. Oh, said the man, okay. I'll buy the cow of you for $300, uh, but I haven't got any money on me. I'll come back to the same spot next, uh, tomorrow, and I'll give you the money. But I'll take the cow first. Is that okay? The man said, no, 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 no. How can I trust you? Oh, said the man, you can trust me. I'm a Baptist church deacon. Well, said the man, okay, sounds good. So he said, okay, you can have the cow. I'll see you tomorrow. So this cow owner then went back to his home, and as he got back home, he said to his wife, he said, darling, what is a Baptist church deacon? Well, said the wife, it's about the same as a Mennonite church elder. <laughs> oh dear, said the man, I think I've lost the cow. <laughs> you know, when you don't know where you're going, it's easy to begin to go back and try to correct your mistakes. But when we say God is unchanging, He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't, he doesn't go, oops, you know, oh God, like a Britney Spears old song. Oops, I did it again, you know? And I've got to go and correct it again. No, God doesn't do that. He is unchanging. But there are some passages in the Bible that seem to suggest that God changes His mind sometimes. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. He regretted. Another verse, Exodus 32 verse 14 says, And the Lord relented from the disaster that He had spoken of bringing on His people. These are the words, regretted, relented, as though God, as though it seems to imply that God wants to go back and do it again. That God made a mistake on the way. So we have now two apparently contradicting, uh, you know, postures in the Scripture. How do we explain these apparent contradictions? There are actually, in the Bible, three ways of explaining this apparent contradiction. Okay. The first is this, that when the Bible talks about regret and relenting, God relenting and regretting, it is using inadequate 
human language to describe God's divine feelings. Divine feelings. Actually, the word regret, for example, is meant to convey God's deep, deep sorrow, more than any one of us can sorrow about the way man has sinned after he has created man. But that sorrow is not enough for him to go back to revise the whole of mankind again. In other words, to destroy all of mankind and to start over again. Because if he did, none of us would be here today. But, you know, but there's a regret. We use the word regret because we're trying to use inadequate human language to describe what God's feelings are. And we can only, we can only understand it from our own feelings. You know, we do it all the time amongst to describe our feelings. For example, if somebody says, I'm cheesed off. Now, you know what it means, right? Uh, cheesed off. How does, what cheesed off means actually very disgruntled, very disgruntled, you know, you know really kind of fed up, you know, of, of somebody or something. How do you get, well, you know, a cheese when it's gone bad describes your kind of feelings of how a situation is. Or cheese when it's actually gone bad and gone brown and it begins to stink tells you that, you know what, you know, it, it's very dissatisfying, it's, it's very stinky, it's, it, you're disgruntled, you're upset with it. So we use the picture of cheesed off to describe our own emotions. In the same way, the Bible uses our own emotions to ascribe to how God is feeling, but it's only a fraction of the real thing of how God is feeling. So we cannot draw theological conclusions from just human emotional language. We use them and describe them to God in order to understand something of how God feels. So when we say God relents or God regrets, we know that God is sorrowing, but not in the way that we think He's made a mistake. This kind of inadequate human language which we use to describe God's feelings is called by this technical term, anthropopathisms. Okay, it's a big word. Somebody say, wow. The word anthropo, anthropo means man. Pathisms come from the Greek word pathos, which means feelings, man's feelings. So you know a big word now, okay? Anthropopathisms. That's the first thing. So what the Bible says about regret and relentless, relenting, is not what it fully is. That's the first way of solving the apparent contradiction. The second way is what we would call conditional intentions. Conditional intentions. Because you have two passages, where God can change his mind, God can't change his mind. So what is it? Conditional intentions. Let me give you an example. Exodus 32 verses 9 to 10 is a conditional intention. When the people worshipped the golden calf, the wrath of God burned. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen how rebellious and stubborn these people are. Now leave me alone and I will destroy them. God has expressed his intent. He will destroy his people because they have gone into idolatry and worshipping the golden calf. Did he do it? No. Did he change his mind? Well, in, implicit in this word, I will destroy them, is a condition. Although he didn't say it, it was not stated. This is a conditional intention. It is in there. How do we know? Because when Moses looked at what, listened to what God said, and then he repented before God, interceded on behalf of the people, went down, got the people to repent, so that they turned away from worshipping the golden calf. The wrath of God was satisfied. Because what that was done was consistent with God's holiness and righteousness and justice, with who He was as a person. It was entirely consistent. And therefore, there was not even any need to change because it was, it was given. He was consistent with Himself that there would be no destruction. So sometimes when God says He will do a thing, actually, it is a conditional intention, although it is not stated. So that's the second way uh, we overcome this apparent paradox. And here's the third way. Here's the third way to find out why does God change His mind or not. And this is called theological bridging. Okay, this is called theological bridging. In theological bridging, what are we trying to bridge? Essentially, we are trying to bridge two things. We are trying to bridge the, build a bridge between predestination by God and the free will of man. Predestination by God and the free will of man. Predestination is a big word. But it means God has a foreknowledge about what will happen and how we will choose. That's, that's predestination. God knows everything. He knows which direction we'll choose. He has foreknowledge about the end from the beginning. He knows what it's going to be. 
But when you have this, you have a problem because it seems as though man doesn't have free will. Okay? Because then predestination is the doctrine of Calvinism. Okay? Just bear with me this couple of words now. Uh, this is probably the hardest sermon I'm going to preach the whole of this year. Okay? Yeah. It's the doctrine of Calvinism. It was proposed by John Calvin, a Swiss reformer in the 1500s. Okay? Predestination. In predestination, yeah, you do not appear to have free will. But then there is another Christian belief and view that free will, we have free will, and it is free will that det determines the end, not the predestination of God. So free will, will means that God has no predetermined cause, but gives us our free will to determine the outcome. Are you with me? Say an amen. amen. You're with me, okay? And this doctrine is called Arminianism. Okay, Arminianism was again promoted by a Dutch reformer by the name of Jacobus Arminia, Arminus. So, so, these, these, so you have free will and you have predestination. And the two seems to be at loggerhead. So which does the Bible support? I mean, has God determined everything so that He will never change His mind? Or can we, with free will, change God's mind? Well, you look at the Bible, the, uh, there are passages that seem to support predestination, that God has predestined. For example, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 14 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. That's predestination. I have determined it, it will not change. But there are other passages in the Bible that seem to suggest free will, like salvation, free will. Romans 10, verse 13. It says here, For whoever calls, it's up to you to call, but if you come to Jesus and whoever calls on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So it's, it's our free will being exercised. So which is it? Is it predestination or is it Arminianism? Since these two views came out for the last 500 years, Christians have actually deferred. And we have not been able to resolve this. But I would like to give you a third view, which I hope will be helpful to you as to how God, we can come into God, to God and still, in a way, cause God to change His mind. And this third view is called Molinism, okay? Sorry about this, a little bit heavy, but Molinism. Molinism was, is a view to try to, a middle view to try to bridge the theological divide between predestination and Arminianism. It was advocated by a Jesuit theologian in about the 17th century, in the 1600s. Uh, called Louis Molina. And this is what Molinism is. In Molinism, God has foreknowledge. He already knows what happened in the end of everything that could happen or will happen. But He also knows everything that would happen under all possible circumstances. So for example, if you were transported back to the first century AD and you were in the position of Pontius Pilate, assuming... God would know you with all your personality and all that in the circumstances of first century AD, in the position of Pontius Pilate, he would know what you would do, what decision you would make. So all, but not just that, but in any and every circumstance you are in, God knows all the possible and the potential decisions that you will make. So in other words now, what he means is this, in every possible circumstance, God would know what you would really and freely do and what the outcome would be. Now, listen to this. He's not causing you to do it. In other words, you are free to still exercise your free will, but He knows all the potential things that you could do in that situation, but He already knows what you are likely to, what, likely to do, what you will do. And as you exercise it, it's out of your free will. He didn't cause you to do it. But because God knows what you would freely do in every possible circumstance, He therefore knows the future. He therefore knows the hand, end. Okay, so He foreknows, but He didn't predetermine it because your free will came into play. This is called not foreknowledge, not free knowledge, but middle knowledge. And middle knowledge is Molinism. Now, is there any scripture support for Molinism? Matthew 11 Verse 23, uh, uh, one of the passages, there are quite a few, many, but this is Jesus. Jesus said, And you, Capernaum, shall be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, 
it would have remained until this day. What Jesus is saying is this. He said, you, Capernaum, you shall be brought down to hell. But if the mighty works, if Sodom existed today in the first century AD, Jesus is saying, Jesus said that God would know that in those circumstances, Sodom would have repented. In those circumstances, Sodom would have freely repented. But the incident in Sodom took place during the time of Abraham. And in that circumstance, Sodom freely did not repent. God already knew this. So you see, this is how Molinism works. When you look at this middle knowledge, then the conclusion we draw is this. So from this middle knowledge perspective, while God knows every outcome, and He knows a particular outcome, we are still free to pray to get God to change His mind. Can somebody say amen? Make sense to you? This is what. Therefore, while God knows every outcome, we are still free, using our own free will to pray to get God to change His mind. Now, this is not a spiritual trick. It's not a spiritual trick. You know, it's a spiritual journey. So as we take this journey, we exercise our free will in prayer and coming before God. We don't know the outcome, but God knows. And as we engage with God, there are various possibilities that can happen. It can appear to us as if the course of God can change and the and, and outcome can change. So when we understand this, we will understand this. This will help us. So when Abraham comes before God to pray for Sodom, he doesn't know his outcome. He doesn't know. There are so many options, but God knows in these options what the outcome will be. But Abraham will, will, will speak to God and he had exercised his free choice. And in so doing, there are four things Abraham did. So if we want to change God's mind, we want to come to a point where we, we speak to God and say, God, you know, we, we want, we, can you do this? There are four things Abraham did. We see this in his intercession in Genesis 18. The first thing that he did was he became God's friend, best friend, not just friend, but the best friend. When he came before God to intercede like that, to change God's mind, he was already a best friend with God. This tells us, I tell you, when you understand Abraham's position, you really want to become God's best friend. Isaiah 41 verse 8 tells us that Abraham was God's best friend. But you, Israel, are my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. James chapter 2 verse 23, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. That's New King James. The friend of God. He was God's bestie. He was God's best friend. He had walked with God. And this is what happened. When the three men left to go towards Sodom, the three angels, this is what the Bible says. Abraham stood before God. Firstly, you stand before God. And then he drew near to God. Now, when you stand before somebody, you are probably friend with somebody. If Abraham was just a servant, he would bow down and worship God. He was. He was, in a sense, also a servant of God. But in the position in which he was interceding for Sodom, he was a friend of God. He goes before God and stood before God. It's just like my best friend. When my best friends come and see me, they don't come and bow before me. They go and scrape before me. They walk in high. They stood before. And they draw near to you. They draw near to me. And, and, and Abraham stood before God and he drew near God. Now, what does it mean when you, you have that? There's an implicit trust between Abraham and God. This man is Mark Wellman. Mark Wellman is the first ever person who is a paralytic to ever climb the El Capitan granite face in Yosemite Park in the United States. 3,000 of sheer vertical height. 1989, first paraplegic to ever climb Yosemite Park. Um, uh, El Capitan. And he did it. It took seven days. Seven days to pull himself up. You know, bit by bit. And you say, how, how, what happened in the nights? He moved, you know, he bivouacked and he actually rested the nights on some little hammocks. But he took seven days. And by the time he came up to the top, and the reason why this was possible was because he had a friend with him. Mike Corbett. Mike Corbett assisted him all the way, although... Uh, although Wellman was the one to climb, Mark Wellman was the one to climb. And at the last bit of El Capitan, as they come over the head, ledge, you know, when they get over, just at the top, then you have to just take a small trail to get up to the real peak, la summit, because that's, you know, the last 30, 40 yards. 
you could see a picture of his friend carrying him. He ain't heavy. He's my brother carrying him. What most people don't know is that his friend, Mike Corbett, climbed El Capitan three times solo in order to chart the path out and to make sure his friend, who was a paraplegic, would succeed when he climbed on that day. He climbed three times before he climbed, before he made the final climb with his friend. He climbed alone. And this is what God does when we, have, when we become a trusted relationship with Him. It's a basic trust. This kind of friendship is a trust because you, you die on a mountain together or you survive together. It's a trust. Abraham had built that trust with God. His trust in God was so complete that God's trust in him was complicit. So when the, the angels left, Abraham drew near, stood before God. That's the first thing. I pray that if you say, Pastor, I want to learn to change God's mind. Learn to come before Him as a friend. Wow! You trust Him completely to the point that when He talks to you and you obey, He trusts you complicitly, implicitly, and complicitly, completely in what He wants you to do. Secondly, Abraham understood God's burden, God's burden for him. You see, God's burden about Sodom is quite different from Abraham's burden, burden about Sodom. But Abraham understood it. What was God's burden about Sodom? God's burden about Sodom was an evil, perverted, wicked city and God was going to destroy it. What was Abraham's burden? Abraham's burden is that too, but that's not the main burden. The main burden for Abraham was because his nephew, Lot, was in Sodom with his family. That was his burden. And how is it? Often when we want God to change the minds of, of things, we have our personal burden. But I want to say this to you, if you're truly God's friend, you understand God's burden first. He understood God's burden. And then only did he bring before God in the next step his own burden. He understood God was righteous, God was, God was fair, God was at, you know, moral in wanting to destroy Sodom. God was fair, God was righteous. And if God had destroyed Sodom just the way it was, his own nephew Lot and the family would have also been destroyed. He knew that. But, and, and that would be righteous. That would be right too. But Abraham's burden was, I want to save my nephew Lot. You know, and when we have this kind of burden, we, we know that when we understand God's bigger burden, we can rest our smaller burden on Him, which we want to pray for Him to change His mind. You know, it reminds me of a, a man who was, uh, who was you know, just uh, having a, a donkey cart, and then he saw a man carrying a heavy load walking by the roadside. And he asked this man who was carrying a heavy load, he took pity on him and said, can you sit on my donkey cart? And so the man sat on the back of his donkey cart, but then the driver of the donkey cart noticed that this man never unloaded his load. And he says, hey, you can unload your load. Oh, no, no, said the man, I see your donkey already struggling. I don't want to load him up any further. And some of us think it's like that. We will load God. Hey, listen, your burden is nothing compared to God's burden. If you take God's burden, your burden will be included. Can somebody say an amen to that? Amen. And here's the third thing. Abraham was bold before God. Somebody say bold. He was really bold before God. You know, Abraham was bold before God because he knew how God thinks. He was a friend of God. He already and you know, knew God's burdens. He knew how God thinks. And you know, when you, are, you know how somebody thinks, you will always be bold. You know, how many of you are in love with the Inland Revenue? You know, Lambaga Hasil Dalam Negri. How many of you love them? Put up your hands. Do you know? But you know, if you want to go and they call you for something and there's a case for you to answer or whatever, they want clarification about your accounts, you must know how they think. Because there's, there's somebody I knew who, who, was, who, who said, you know what, all my accounts are clean, I can show it to them. And he doesn't know how they think, and he went in, and then, you know, it was all over the place. Eventually, he landed up with a huge penalty, a huge penalty. Then eventually, he hired a tax consultant, and the tax consultant said, you cannot do this, it's not the way they think. Your accounts are good, but that's not the way they think. And then they went back to the Inland Revenue, and eventually, you know, the penalty was reduced incredibly. You must know how they think. Because Abraham knew how God thinks. 
He was able to come before God and cry to God and he bargained, seemingly bargained with God. You know, for us, if we were standing by and watching Abraham talk to God, you'd think, wow, this guy, huh? Mjis Ewan. You know, so brave. He, how dare he? God, 50 people, can or not? God said can. 45, can or not? God said can. 40, can or not? Can. Oh God, please forgive me, but 30, can or not? 30, uh, can or God said, okay, can also. There's a 20, can or not? 20, 20, God, can or? And you're still holding your breath. Wow, when? How dare he come before God and bargain like that? You know, God will, start, will turn away his face in disgust with him and tell and swipe Abraham out of the way. And God will probably say to him, who do you think I am? You think I'm a vegetable seller? You know, you can bargain like that. And you, you're watching. And then he goes down from 20 to 10. To 10. And you say, he's, he's had it this time. Finish! And then you think, wow. God says, can. 10. How is it possible? He knows God. He knows how God thinks. He's a friend of God. He can say it like that. How many of you, but I would tell you, it is not the bargaining that changes God's mind. I know some of you are very, very good at bargaining. All those who are good at bargaining, put up your hands. Wave it in the air. I know you go to the market, you get all the cheap chicken and the vegetables and the fish because you're good at bargaining. But you can never beat my late mother. She's the best one. Especially when it comes to buying durians in Penang. Oh man. I go to I go to Penang and I buy durians, I get, you know, I get slaughtered. You know, basically uh, all my durians are really expensive. She she parks the car about a mile away. The Volvo about a mile away. Then she walks in a simple kind of attire up to the durian store. And people think, oh yeah, I e this is this auntie is coming. And she says, Ah, how much is durian? She makes friends with a durian seller. And she and then I hear her bargaining. I'm there. You know, dressed in my shorts and watch her bargaining. She goes from 50 to 40, do the Abraham thing, 30 to 20. And eventually, the durian seller sells it to her for 10. And the durian seller is still very happy, ha ha ha, smiling. Okay, okay, auntie, make friends with them. She's the best. But why is that possible? Well, it is simply possible because you dare to know God, you go lower. In the old days, in my youth, there was a dance called the Limbo Rock Dance. You know, it's, some of you who are older, <clears throat> can you say an amen to me to encourage me? Okay, the Limbo Rock, you know? And basically it's this, you got, you got this rod, long rod, and the mu music that makes you gyrate your body, and you dance, and you sway, and you know, and you, and, and you kind of share, share below the Limbo Stick, as it were. And the lower you can go, the better you are at that dance. Can somebody say amen to that? I know you, many of you, you could go very low, but some of you are a bit older now, cannot anymore, okay? You can't do that anymore. And the refrain of the song comes round again and again. Limbo lower now. Limbo lower now. How low can you go? Okay, how low can you go? Abraham, how low can you go? How low can you go? He went to 10 from 50. And the reason why he was able to do that, because he was bold. You see, we can change and get God's heart because we are bold because of our relationship, because we have his burden, because we're his besties. And when he did that, Abraham went away blessed. Somebody say blessed. Question I've always asked myself is, why did Abraham stop at 10? I don't know the answer. The Bible doesn't tell me the answer. But Abraham knew his, his nephew Lot and the wife was in, in, um, in Sodom. And they had two daughters. Now, Abraham hadn't seen them for a while, maybe a year, a couple of years. Two daughters, we know four of them all together, therefore. Four of them all together. But Abraham probably thought, you know, I've not seen them for a couple of years. Maybe the two daughters have been married. And then maybe, you know, a couple of years, maybe one kid each, like, at most two, like, you know, super fast, at most two. So when you add it together, maximum 10. That's the maximum. So 10 is a safe number. But he didn't know. Lot's daughters were not married. Lot's daughters only had boyfriends, but they were not married, okay, at that point in time. Maybe engaged, but not married that time. So there were only truly four in the real family at that point in time. But why did Abraham stop at 10? Because of family matters. Lot and his wife and his two daughters make four. So he cried out to God, God, 10 cannot 10. 
But I tell you, God knew his heart. See, because he has God's burden in his mind, God's burden because of the wickedness of Sodom, God knew the burden that was in his heart. It was for Lot and his family. And then, when the angel came to the city of Sodom, they found only four righteous people, Lot and his family. Okay? And they're righteous not because they were super good, but Lot was a godly man, and under the covenant in the family, all four were under the covenant of God's mercy. So they were four and righteousness. So they were four righteous people. No more. Even the two boyfriends of the daughters, you read in scriptures, were not holy. And Angel said, one, two, three, four. Nobody. The bargain was ten. And so brimstone and fire came upon, upon the city of Sodom. But before that came, the angel said to Lot, get out with your family. Get out. This is our immediate family. Just get out now. And they ran out. And the fire and brimstone came and destroyed Sodom. And then Lot's wife. We think Lot's wife was probably from the city of Sodom. We think. She was probably one of the natives. She couldn't bata hunt to see her original city, her city, her beloved city on fire. She turned and looked back. And she became the famous pillar of salt. That's why Jesus reminds us, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. But here's the point. Lot and his family were saved. That's why even though the city of Sodom was destroyed, even though it was destroyed, Abraham went away blessed. What he wanted, God gave him. God changed his mind, in a sense, for him. Forgive him the desires of his heart. Can God change his mind? In a sense, yes. If we believe the middle road, in a sense, yes. Does your will count? Yes. Does God know what will happen in the end? Yes. And there we come into understanding that the secret into getting God to change his mind comes because of these four things. Become God's best friend. Grow that today. Keep growing, keep growing so that God can trust you and you can trust him completely. That's the way to walk. You know him. You just know him. And he trusts you implicitly and complicitly for the things he wants you to do. And then you see his burden. But we need this burden for, say, a Malaysia or our city. It's your burden. He's concerned about your burden. Don't think that just because you see his burden, he's lost your burden. He has your burden. And thirdly, when that happens, you can be bold to ask God. And say, God, if you're going to do this to KK or Malaysia, can I ask? If you're going to do this for the business world economy, can I ask for my business? Can I ask for my family? Can I ask for this? Can I, can I ask? Can you do a U-turn for just four? And then finally, Abraham walked away. Best, blessed. He was truly blessed. Because God still destroyed the city. God still finished off the city of Sodom for his wickedness and still judged it. But God gave Abraham the desires of his heart. And that's the secret by which we change God's mind. Father God, I just thank you so much. Lord, that you are the God who knows everything from the end to the beginning. You are the God who is more than able, God, to look after all our needs. But in this journey of walking with you as your sons and daughters, you are teaching us how to pray Turn around prayers. Prayers that will turn around our circumstances. Prayers that will turn around even our own hearts. Prayers that we wouldn't turn around apparently, seemingly, your own heart for our situation. So right now, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you have spoken to us today. Can God change his mind? Oh yes, you believe it. We have a part to play. And God can change His mind. So Father, we thank You today for all that You have spoken to us. And right now, for the grace that is upon us, for the favour that is upon our lives, we give You praise and we give You thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'd like to make one call. You know the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by the Lord. But I would tell you, those were the Old Testament times. Since that time, a Savior has come. His name is Jesus. 
We no longer live under the wrath and the judgment of God. We live under the grace and the mercy of God. It's available to all of us. But if today God is speaking to you, you have never come under the love of Jesus. You have never come under the protection and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Today, will you open your heart to Jesus and pray the simple prayer with me to invite Him into your life? Whether you're on site, online, do this right now. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. Today, I open the door of my heart and I invite you in, into my heart as my Lord, my Savior, and my Master. Thank you, Lord, that grace is available to me. I'm not judged as a sinner if I confess my sins to you, but I am forgiven because of your sacrifice on the cross for me. Today, come into my heart. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my Master. From this day onwards, I give you praise, I give you worship, and I give you thanksgiving. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And all God's wonderful people said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand, everyone. Just welcome to the family of God. Congratulations. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done, for the lives you've been touched. And I just want you to know as you begin this year, you know, God can give you the desires of your heart. You can come into a spirit of intercession. You can come into being God's friend and know Him. And may God bless you in this new year. May you know all that has purpose for you. And then you walk in intercession as His friend so that you will be bold in asking Him for all that He has laid upon your heart. For you, for your family, for your business, for your health for your friendships, for all that you have, that you need. In Jesus' name I pray, all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you again. Amen. Our senior pastor, Pastor Dr. Philip again. Thank you, Pastor, for always encouraging us, you know, telling us how to understand God so that we can ask God for our prayer requests and to partner with the Lord. And so earlier, if the message has touched you in a way where you wanted to invite Jesus to be a part of your life, if this is your first time or if this is a rededication, you haven't been, you know, in touch with God for the longest time and you want Him, you want to feel His presence, you want to know if this God is real, I can tell you that God is real and Jesus loves you. He loves you and He will be your best friend and He will hold your hand till your entire lifetime. And I know sometimes making decisions are a little scary or intimidating, but I tell you, this will be the best decision in your life. Amen. So because of that, we want to congratulate you once again. If you have made that prayer, uh, let follow, follow pastor's prayer, then welcome to the kingdom of God. You are part of God's kingdom right now. And uh, we, we just wanted to help you. Uh, if you would allow us to just uh, connect with you, we want to start you off with some materials. So if you have made that prayer, you know, you just scan the QR code or you can head on to this website. It's www.skylinesib.com slash next step. And, uh, you know, just give us your contact and we will give you some materials and uh, you can start your new journey as a uh, Christ believer. Amen.